This week, let's talk about Japan's South Korea relationships in relation to the latest news. I want to warn you in advance that later in the video, I'll have to talk about historical events involving slavery and sexual violence. So before that point, I'll place a content warning banner in case you want to skip that. Under left-leaning President Moon Jae-in, South Korea relationships with Japan were at an all-time low. But with the election of conservative Yoon Suk kyol in May 2022, the two countries seem to have started a path towards mutual understanding. That is, until a series of recent events. The first one is the South Korean president minister's recent statements regarding nuclear weapons. On January 11th, South Korean President Yoon suk kyol said at a press briefing that if North Korea's nuclear threat rose, South Korea would consider building nuclear weapons of its own, or ask the United States to redeploy them in their country. He then added that the policy was not yet official, and later his office clarified that the Prime Minister had no plans to actually do so. Even so, these declarations were the first time that a sitting president officially mentioned arming the country with nuclear weapons since the United States withdrew their arsenal from the South in 1991. And it could be enough to put ulterior strain on South Korea's diplomatic relationship with both Japan and the US, all part of the same anti-China and anti-North Korea alliance under America's nuclear umbrella protection. No matter the actual viability of this prospect, which would require South Korea to withdraw from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and trigger international sanctions, this statement was enough to irritate the US, which, in the person of National Security Council spokesman John Kirby, brushed away questions on the matter, saying that the focus is for the two countries to quote-unquote improve extended deterrence capabilities against North Korea. Su Kim, a former CIA Korea analyst, said that the debate allows Yoon to put pressure on the US to provide more support. But this move could also drive away Japan, given the fact that even though the country is getting more and more relaxed in regulating nuclear reactors, the population still harbors very intense sentiments against the use of nuclear weapons. Instead, for what concerned the South Korean public, a 2022 survey by an affiliate of Seoul National University found that up to 55.5% of the responders would support a national nuclear program. I would argue that, given the poll, Yoon could also have made this statement to try and garner some internal consent, which is also a very important part of our second set of news and main topic of this video. We are about to talk about wartime laborers and comfort women, and although the news per se is about the first topic, I would like to briefly explain both from a historical perspective, because the two are inevitably interconnected, and they both came up in the recent developments of the two nations' bilateral relationship. Along with the content warning, I would like to remind everyone that I am not a historian, and especially when it comes to wars and battles, I find it hard to approach these topics. Also, most of my research comes from Wikipedia, so if you want to learn all the facts more in detail, go listen to someone that is an actual expert on this stuff. From 1939, the conscription of Japanese males for the military efforts of World War II caused widespread labor shortages, and therefore Japanese officials organized the official recruitment of Koreans to work in mainland Japan, initially through civilian agents and later through coercion. As the labor shortages increased, by 1942 the Japanese authority extended the provision of the National Mobilization Law to include the conscription of Korean workers for factories and mines on the Korean Peninsula and other places, and the involuntary relocation of some of them to Japan itself. Between 1939 and 1945, around 5.4 million Koreans were conscripted, and about 670,000 were taken to Japan for civilian labor, most of the time forced to work under appalling and dangerous conditions. Of these workers, over 60,000 died, while the total number of deaths of Korean forced laborers in Korea and Manchuria is estimated to be between 270,000 and 810,000. In 1946, around 1,340,000 ethnic Koreans were repatriated to Korea, while 650,000 chose to remain in Japan. A 1982 survey by the Korean Youth Association showed that conscripted laborers account for 13% of first-generation Japan-living Koreans. Some had also been drafted to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and had therefore been victims of the atomic tragedy. Long forgotten, in 1993, Japan paid South Korea 4 billion yen and built a welfare center for those suffering from the effects of the atomic bomb. 
the next issue is even more tragic. Comfort women, in Japanese, jugun yanfu, were women and girls forced into sexual slavery by the Imperial Japanese Army before and during World War II. Most of the women were from occupied countries, included Korea, China, and the Philippines, but also Burma, Thailand, Malaya, Taiwan, the Dutch East Indies, and other occupied territories. These women were held as slaves inside the military facilities and lived in the most terrible and disgusting of conditions. In a ridiculous and criminal twist of logic, the declared intent of the army was to reduce the occurrence of wartime rape, like the one perpetrated after the Nanjing massacre, in order to prevent the worsening of the anti-Japanese sentiment, reducing the transmission of venereal disease, and the leakage of military secrets, and when the war was faring for the worst, to quell the rising tensions among the troops. The result of this massacre was tragically a much higher occurrence of rape, STDs transmission, and the death of most of the victims. The women were divided accordingly to their origin, with Dutch and Japanese women being assigned to high-ranking officials, and all the others for the lower-ranking troops. Given the intent to prevent the spread of venereal disease, most of the victims were young girls, sometimes even prepubescent. The number of victims is somewhere in the range of 50,000 to 200,000, with the exact number still being researched and debated. After the war ended, there was a need for the two countries to confront these events and return to a normal diplomatic relationship for what was possible at the time. Therefore, in 1965, the two countries agreed to the Nikkan Kihon Joyaku, the Treaty on Basic Relations between Japan and the Republic of Korea, which normalized their relationship and settled all economical disputes. In particular, Article 2 reads that the parties confirm that the problem concerning various aspects, including rights and interests of juridical persons, are settled completely and finally. But these issues have been, for long, a reason of diplomatic uncertainty between the two countries. In October 2018, the Supreme Court of Korea issued a ruling which ordered the Japanese private companies Nippon Steel and Mitsubishi Heavy Industries to compensate workers from the Korean Peninsula who were forced to work for them. This ruling, along with another one made in January 2021 about Japan's stance on comfort women, was called by Japan a breach of the 1965 agreement. The court proceeded to seize the South Korean assets from the two companies in order to liquidate them and repay the plaintiffs with the profits. But this last part hasn't been carried out yet. Let's keep this information good for later. The issue here is tremendously complicated because it touches a number of subjects. Japan is firm on its stance that all disputes have been settled with the 65 treaty, and legally I'd say that would be correct. But from a moral point of view, Japan has always denied or downplayed its responsibilities in regard to both wartime laborers and comfort women, so far as to take them out of school textbooks. You have to understand that the concept of face in Japanese omote is extremely important in Japan, and it's rooted in centuries of social pressure and norms. Admitting to such atrocities would mean losing face on an international stage, and would have politically devastating consequences for whoever is in charge at the time. This is also why Japan never actually confronted its fascist and colonial past, unlike Germany. Because much like Italy, it focused more on its role as a victim of certain atrocities while averting its eyes from the ones it committed. And therefore, places like Yasukuni Shrine are still allowed to exist. Furthermore, when we confront problems like this one, we have to keep in mind that we're not talking about two people arguing in a court of law. These are countries, two democratic governments with respective populations to please and jurisdictions to defend. The seizing of the Japanese assets has been seen as a power outreach from Seoul, and the Japanese government is loudly protesting the possibility of them being used to repay the victims. Moreover, after taking office, Yun Suk kyol vowed to restore economic and security cooperation with Japan to consolidate the front against North Korea and China. So he's running part of his governance on this issue. And that's the reason why the South Korean government hasn't cashed in on the seized assets yet. That's the reason why in these days, the two governments tried to find a different solution. On January 12th, South Korea's foreign ministry held an open forum of lawyers for the plaintiffs. Prior to this meeting, the government's intention appeared to be pressing Japan to demonstrate a quote-unquote sincere response through a public apology and some sort of compensation, though not necessarily through Nippon Steel and Mitsubishi's assets. 
going against some of the plaintiff's explicit demands. Through this open forum, an alternative proposal took shape, which was then discussed by the two countries' foreign ministers on January 16th. The alternative proposed by the South Korean government would be setting up a joint foundation to collect donations from businesses and governments of both countries that will be presented to the plaintiffs in place of the court-ordered compensation. Compensation that, by the way, amounts to about 143 million yen, for a total of 32 plaintiffs and relatives, which, in my opinion, is nothing, it's so little, and almost all the plaintiffs already died in the meantime, now they're about 15. Anyways, Seoul said it would not seek a written bilateral agreement because in 2015, a previous accord between the two over the issue of comfort women collapsed following vehement opposition from South Korean civic groups. At this point in time, the Japanese government was expected to back the proposal and allow the companies to donate to this fund as long as the demands for money from the two heavy industries companies were dropped, reiterating what was decided with the 1965 treaty. But as of January 17th, the proposal reached an impasse, and now we're at an all-too-common standstill. The Korean lawyers have a mostly negative view of the proposal, having doubts on whether the foundation will actually gather any donation. And also, they understandably want a clear apology from the two companies. Concern, the last one, which was echoed by high-ranking officials in the South Korean government, who said that the government needs to get the understanding on the of the population on this one, and to do so, it needs a clear response from the Japanese side. From the Japanese side, the response has been that South Korea still has to figure out the proposal for themselves, and that it's its official's responsibility to block the Supreme Court's decision on the two companies' assets. Companies that in the meantime said that these should be resolved by the governments. So yeah, things are not moving forward for now. Seoul say they wait for Tokyo's response, Tokyo says they won't respond until Seoul makes clear proposals. On the same day, Fumio Kishida and Yoon Suk Kyol held a press conference in Seoul where both prime ministers pledged to make efforts to improve the ties and stressed how important it is that the two countries can start cooperating again. And even if I would be skeptical in a normal situation that things would move any further, given Japan's history of stubbornness under right-leaning governments, I think we will see things moving forward in the coming days. The threat to the two countries is really unprecedented, and between the pressure mounting from North Korea and possible Chinese actions around Taiwan, both governments have the utmost interest in mending their relationship as soon as they can. This is it. I am Kay, and this is my weekly news analysis. Please let me understand if you like this kind of videos and if you have any suggestions on how to improve them. As always, thank you for watching, and if you like my content, please leave a comment, like, and subscribe. See ya!